I offer these every week along with a guided meditation. Just click the uh, subscribe link below to be notified through YouTube when I post the latest recording. Or if you'd like to join us live, which would be great, uh, just go into the description section below and follow the link along to be able to sign up for free. I'd like to say a couple of things about that meditation. Um, the first is that uh, it can be challenging to disengage from our mind's understandable and habitual process of focusing on one thing after another. In other words, on one part after another of what's streaming along in consciousness. Perfectly understandable. And from a survival standpoint in evolution, yeah, it would be really useful to really focus on the sound of the twigs breaking nearby as a predator might be approaching, uh, or the sound of your friends uh, calling to you. That would be really useful. So it's understandable if it's kind of hard to stabilize that. On the other hand, it is true, just factually true, that um, <clears throat> what is occurring as your process and this process and their process uh, is a single process. It has many elements in it, but when we expand out to the whole, it's clearly there is a whole which includes awareness. We might start with, we might get to awareness of the whole um, contents of awareness, but there's a further step in which awareness and its contents are understood and in particular experienced as a single whole process that's occurring. Uh, that it also uh, is entwined with a whole physical process, including matter and energy, um, that's also, that is occurring. One whole single process. And why is that useful? Why is it recommended uh, in various ways in various traditions? Uh, there are multiple reasons. One is that simply going out to the whole is an immediate circuit breaker around suffering. There still may be parts in the stream of consciousness, such as some people mentioned earlier in the chat, you can see it, um, sadness over the loss of a loved one or a breakup that one has been trying to accept and working with, but still when one is reminded of it or it bubbles up, there's sadness and other feelings perhaps with it. That may still be occurring. Um, but as we go out to the whole, uh, the sense of being upset about or bothered by the various parts, you know, getting caught up in what the Buddha called the second darts that we add to the first darts, the first arrows, the first inescapable discomforts of various kinds, physical and emotional, um, in life. Uh, when we go out to the whole, we're disidentified from those parts. We're not struggling with the parts. We're less caught up by, in them. We're not as near to them in terms of our moment, in terms of our attention. We're out in the whole. It's also true that um, <clears throat> an awareness of whole, uh, as I said earlier, I think, elsewhere, uh, that awareness of the whole uh, quiets rumination and reduces the sense of self and pulls us into the present just as a whole. And third, <clears throat> as I got to at the very end, as the sense of you, in the broadest sense, as the sense of yourself occurring as a single whole process remarkably, right? Um, that is a very short distance from there to realizing and feeling that this whole process of you is, as I said at the end, the universe occurring locally, unfolding locally in its way, which includes 
intentions, plans, reactions, understandings, it's all part of the local, it's all a local expression of the universe unfolding here as you now. Ooh, and that makes the boundaries, the edges between you and reality starts to get more blurred. This is not an invitation into psychosis. Uh, Be careful if you're vulnerable in that way. But otherwise, there could be an increasingly diffuse sense of the boundaries, the edges between the unfolding of you, you as the total body-mind process that's wearing your clothes right now. Uh, you have a looser sense that, and, and more of a, a grateful feeling for the vastness of all the causes and conditions that are manifesting locally, presently, whew, as you. And weirdly, in the awareness of that deterministic process, largely, if not entirely deterministic, which could feel somehow trapped, there actually can be a kind of incredible lightheartedness and even laughter in that recognition of um, oneness, really, with everything. Grounded in the practices we did there, for 35 minutes, just 35 minutes. And with repetition, you can become more and more able to stabilize and sustain more and more seconds in a row with more and more rapid return if you lose it to those new seconds in a row, the sense of of being as a whole. And to finish in that, uh, in the sense of being uh, that that can become stronger and stronger for you. Uh, There's a disengagement. There can be a disengagement from becoming, becoming. And the Buddha identified basically uh, different kinds of attachments. And one of them that he called out was this tendency to want to keep becoming. Now the brain keeps on becoming. It's oriented that way. It's an expectation generator. And it's constantly you know, um, forecasting and comparing the forecast to actual in this process of becoming. But with mindfulness, you can be aware of the sense of becoming, which can have a sense of urgency to it or mustness, drivenness, insistence, leaning, and especially in its contrast to simply being. And more and more, you can get rested in simply being, uh, as they say in Zen, um, no gaining mind. Gaining is a kind of becoming. Now, there's a place for deliberately trying to become, um, you know, X or Y, you know, to to become someone who's walking through the door with some groceries because you need to get some groceries. There's a place for that kind of thing. But uh, we tend to get intensely trained into becoming, including in our culture. It's very much about chasing the next shiny object, including shiny pleasures of various kinds or becoming a someone, a someone who. And um, with practice, as you rest in being, the contrast between being and becoming becomes more and more stark. And you become more and more disenchanted with the endless quest, the searching, the seeking, the becoming um, that's unnecessary, that which is beyond appropriate, prudent planning and valuing of various kinds, fine. But beyond that, more and more we like, Oh, what a relief. (laughs) Instead of being (coughs) chained to a kind of pulley that's constantly trying to drag us into the future as we become, we become increasingly released of it and more and more able to stay in the the eternal present, simply being. And being able to do that is really aided by uh, deepening your rootedness in simply being. This is a segue into my topic tonight, and um, it has to do with um, having dinner, uh, my wife and I, with two friends of ours, John and Christian Prendergast. 
and I don't mind using their names. Uh, John has been a guest teacher in the past. He'll be a guest teacher again, I'm sure, in the future. Uh, deep, 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 wise, uh, non-dual teacher. And Christian as well. Deep, deep, wise, non-dual teacher. And uh, we were having dinner, talking about this sort of stuff. And um, I forget the context, but she leaned forward and smiled and said, you are whole and complete. There is nothing to add. And I think her you there was a universal you. It included me, but it was a universal you. And sometimes somebody says something and it, you know, and it may be a different context, a different person saying it. Uh, it might seem like some sort of platitude, like a Hallmark card thing. Um, or, you know, like the, the headline for some sort of social media post. Um, but every so often, these platitudes, if you will, these simple direct teachings really penetrate. And this one has really penetrated for me. So I want to explore it with you. And I invite you to explore this in an experiential kind of way. One way into it can be to softly say to yourself different versions of this and then see how you react to it. How do you react to it? Um, for example, you might say softly, I am whole. I am whole. Or you might use your name. If I used my name, it would be something like, Rick, you are whole. And then how does that land? How does it feel? Is there uh, maybe a melting into it? Perhaps, on the other hand, is there a, eh, don't get it, or both? Or maybe it's just words, right? And it's really okay to find other words that uh, work for you, or no words at all. Uh, you might simply have an image of wholeness, right? Including the classic, gosh, I think it's Enko, uh, in Zen calligraphy of just emptiness, wholeness, shunyata, wholeness. Um, or this, the line, um, complete, and so. Thank you very much, and so. Thanks, Elaine. Um, you know, I am complete. Huh. For me, that's more emotionally saturated. Rick, you are complete. Or you might imagine someone outside you, a wise person, a being. Uh, you can use me if you like, others. Uh, it's, I think it's fun to play with this sometimes. You know, the fairy godmother character in Sleeping Beauty saying to you, you are complete. You, your name, are complete. Huh. What happens then? And then there is nothing to add. There is nothing to add. How does that feel? You might play with the language of it, the words of it. You know, you might say, I'll, I'll use some of the names that I'm seeing here. Um, Elaine, you don't have to add anything to be okay. Oh, you know, there's nothing to add. The point of all this is experiential, and I'm going to pursue this further with you, but I want to create a bit of a frame in that um, if you're like me, you know, you can get a little too caught up sometimes in the, the literal meanings of things or the logic about it or a critique of it or, you know, a postmodernist unpacking of it, blah, 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 blah. The way to relate to this, I think, and I think it's, I suspect, how it sits uh, and sat for Christian, who's very somatically oriented, body oriented, is to think of this or as a kind of incantation or a kind of intuitive opening, not getting too caught up in the literal meanings of it. Because, of course, there is a place 
as I said before our formal start, with reference to the, pardon me, mindfulness of breathing sutta, there is a place for practicing with the mind, or as someone pointed out, training the mind. There's a place for that. Why do we train the mind? It's because there's some benefit uh, that we're going after in training the mind. It's okay. So we're adding training. And sometimes what we're doing is subtracting various things we're releasing. You know, there's a place for that. But that process of practice can be included in the wholeness you already are, the completeness you already are. Um, second, it's possible to understand the literal meaning of this um, as being about that which underlies kind of ordinary neurotic mental processes that are searching for this, trying to become that, pushing that away, caught up in rumination. And the, the teaching there about being whole and complete with nothing to add um, gets underneath, is speaking to a wholeness, an inherent all rightness, an inherent goodness, your inherent Buddha nature, if you will, that's underneath it all or woven into all of it unstainable, unbreakable, uncorruptible, uh, extending ultimately, if you will, into that which is deathless, that which is unconditioned, timeless, whole and complete, nothing to add. We can also appreciate that um, maybe, you know, we are deliberately engaging practices, but they're understood as processes of uncovering or um, clearing, removing that which obscures or hinders or covers our true nature. For example, as you may know, in Buddhism, there are identified what are called the five hindrances. That's a typical English translation, hindrances of, um, you know, basically attachment to sense pleasures, which includes pushing away pain, um, the hindrance of um, sloth and torpor, you know, lethargy, fatigue, the hindrance of restlessness, maybe uh, remorse or anxiety, um, the hindrance of um, doubt, right? And um, the hindrance of ill will. These are five. And there's a lot of good practice about them. But interestingly, as I learned from Gil Fronstall, maybe a better translation of the Pali, an early key language uh, in, in early Buddhism, a translation from the Pali is not hindrance, that which hinders our forward movement. Although there's a, you can, un, you can think of our natural forward movement in practice being hindered by one or more of those five things. Um, Gil's perhaps better translation of the word, is coverings. That which covers the light, which is already there, that which covers our true nature, and we're removing the coverings so that who we are can shine forth more freely and is increasingly revealed to us and to other people. So that's a, that's a way to understand it. So then to bring it home, in terms of our own practice, I want to speak to uh, what Tara Brock calls the trance of unworthiness. Beautiful phrase. And um, the ways in which uh, we tend to uh, not believe that we're already whole, not believe that we're already complete, and not believe that there's nothing to add. Uh, I can think about my own, um, you know, unfolding in my in my career and I've been working now one way or another for more than 50 years uh, started young and um, you know I think of it as the the two the two horses the two ponies going down the same track and as long as at least one of them is going down the track the wise the wise pony uh, then it's okay that the other one is doing its thing uh, I think of that other pony as you know various names for it for me like the the goofy pony or the neurotic pony, whatever, um, and the unwise pony. Anyway, so 
there could be a lot of accomplishing. You know, we can be wanting to serve and help and contribute and fully express ourselves and actualize ourselves. All them good, good, good. And yet alongside it, maybe, I speak from some experience, there could be a part that says, you know, I just need to be somebody. I need to become this. I need to add that because of something inadequate or missing already inside. Yeah? Like doubt of self, doubt of all rightness already, a sense that we need to get more, be more, do more, um, to be good enough, to be all right to be able to take our place as the Buddha did, metaphorically or actually on the night of his awakening when he reached down um, for witness and refuge and touched Mother Earth. Uh, So the teaching here and the feeling of you are whole and complete, there is nothing to add, can really speak to our quests to somehow become adequate, to become worthy of love, to become a good enough person, to escape the long shadow of our misdeeds, our mistakes in our past. And the teaching here is that while there's certainly a place for appropriate repairs and for lessons learned and uncovering true nature and all the rest of that, there's something very powerful about softening emotionally into the refuge of feeling okay enough already. You don't have to add anything. And in that can be a a close friend of accepting yourself fully, warts and all. In the wholeness and completeness are some things, whatever they may be. You know, irritabilities here, uh, habits there, addictions in, coming around the corner. It's all there. It's all there, and it's okay. You know, um, we don't need to fix it to be complete and whole as we are, as we are, right? You don't need to add anything uh, to be to be allowed to reach down and touch the earth yourself. It's a kind of profound benediction, a kind of benediction being like a goodwill, um, good speech, a, a blessing for yourself. The, profound benediction in realizing it is enough to stand on this earth. That's enough. You're you're whole. You're complete already. You don't have to add anything. It's good enough to be here as you are already. Ah, And to feel that and to stabilize, to establish yourself in that, that can be very, 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 very important particularly if you've internalized as I did and so many do for both person, you know, personal or individual rather, both individual and systemic reasons, the internalization of, you know, you got to add more, you got to add more, you're not good enough already. Um, there's a, you're tainted somehow, you're damaged inside, you got to fix something inside, you know, to the extent that we've internalized that um, in all kinds of ways, uh, sometimes well-intended by other people who are trying to prod us or motivate us or to steer us clear or get us to walk, you know, on the on the high road, whatever it might be, we've internalized it. How great to just stand aside from it, fully accepting yourself, releasing, stepping, waking up from that trance of unworthiness. Right. Guided, resting in, you are whole, you are complete. There's nothing to add. So I invite you to um, reflect on this, all right? And um, see what it feels like to rest in this place yourself and to build on it, perhaps even more challenging, 
to come from this place with others, toward others, about them. Oh, <laughs> whoa. <laughs> um, I think about couples I've counseled and you know, sometimes, usually what happens, there's a plaintiff and defendant and the plaintiff essentially has a list. And uh, I still remember one of the defendants saying, you know, I asked, I asked that person, what's on your list? And they said that the other person's list go away, right? So we, we I do, I, I do, have a little list about key people. You might ask yourself, what's your little list? And maybe not so little about one or more people in your life. And then, gosh, what happens <laughs> when you're aware of the list? So I'm thinking of my wife right now, and then I'll start thinking about a few other people. What happens when you're aware of the list while, while stepping aside from it and imagine saying and believing to that other person, toward that other person, you are whole already. You are complete already. There's nothing to add. And to rest in the ways that that is true, which could be alongside having understandable requests for them or clear boundaries you're establishing, and also to rest in that which is true for you in the stance and the knowing over that you are whole already, you are complete already, there is nothing you need to add. Yeah. And then third, so I'm moving from how you are toward yourself, and then second, the application of this simple statement to your orientation to another person, okay? And then, possibly, with key people, as appropriate, asking them if they can relate to you in this way, as good enough already, with a kind of benediction, a kind of blessing from them, with them waking up from their trance that thinks you are unworthy. That could be a real thing, couldn't it? I'm not talking about badgering people or hammering them with some kind of, you know, self-helpy wisdom. I mean, from the heart, you know? There's certain people in our lives that we just feel we're always on the bubble around, you know? We're always having to prove ourselves. We're only as good as our most recent performance and all the rest of that. And it can just get wearing or tiring. Um, I notice what it feels like when I'm around certain people that I feel like I somehow need to prove myself or I keep, I feel kind of motivated somehow to impress them. And after a while, I've uh, realized that what's helpful is to look over there. What's the vibe or the 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 attitude or the reservations that they are um, resting in that motivate us to feel like uh, a little unsettled around them. Got to prove ourselves. Got to impress them. Um, Got to uh, make sure they know that that we know. Right? Whatever. Um, well, somebody like that maybe is someone for you that would be appropriate for you to. Um, you know, for you to either internally step out of the script they're trying to write you in, or if it's appropriate, perhaps, to actually surface it with them and let them know maybe in a deep fundamental way that um, you're, you know, you're, you want to perform well or you want to keep your agreements with them. And underneath it all, you're really happy with yourself. You're really content to be who you are, and uh, you're released from efforts to prove yourself to them, or find other ways to talk about it, perhaps. Okay, so three ways to engage experientially um, the teaching that you are whole, you are complete, 
and you have nothing to add. Good. So I want to respond to a couple of comments that came in shortly after the meditation and um, some, some language there. And uh, about, first of all, what do I mean by non-dual? And very briefly, a non-dual is a term that, um, in my view, can mean three kinds of things. Uh, and often the word is used even in two or more separate ways in the single sentence. So it's helpful to be clear about it, not to be semantic or you know picky about it, but just to understand it. One is that our, our consciousness, our beingness, moment to moment, the stream of consciousness, the stream of experiences can be regarded and experienced as non-dual, which is to say undivided, not two, one, single, whole um, process of mind occurring and unfolding, uh, rooted in a single, whole, non-dual body-mind process unfolding. That's one way to understand it. And I speak to that mode of understanding non-dual in the fourth practice of awakening in my book, Neurodharma, the chapter on wholeness, being wholeness, okay? Second way that non-dual is often used is that uh, a sense of that uh, the Big Bang universe is non-dual, that it's one single unfolding space-time bubble. Um, <clears throat> so that boundaries blur between self and world, people can have non-dual self-transcendent experiences in which the sense of being a separate body-mind se and separate self um, poof, fade, dissolve, and shh, one with everything. That's a different, that's a kind of non-duality as well. That's about our nature in objective reality. And then an ultimate kind of non-duality. And it's helpful for me to mark these distinctions to know what we're talking about um, ultimate non-duality is a non-duality, a, a, a oneness of the ordinary Big Bang universe, the natural unfolding Big Bang universe, and uh, that which is transcendentally distinct. Ground, spirit, divine, God, unconditioned, deathless, timeless, eternal. Now, some people including teachers of mine and friends, can go right through the first and second. The set first kind of non-duality, check, good. Second kind of non-duality, yeah, been there, can show, great. Third kind, eh, eh, I don't, they say. Uh, I, don't, I don't relate to, I don't have a sense of, I don't really believe in um, a kind of transcendental aspect to ultimate reality that's meaningfully distinct from the natural, uh, ordinary, unfolding Big Bang universe, so I stop there. Okay, fine. A lot of people, though, me included, that third kind of non-duality um, is actually profoundly meaningful. So that's a way to understand that, non-duality. And I find those three ways of trying to also track what people mean when they're using the term non-dual or writing about it, that could be really helpful. And then consciousness and awareness, great question that came through. Uh, people use those terms in different ways. Um, <clears throat> consciousness basically has two separate meanings, so I tend to not use it. Um, I tend to use awareness instead uh, because it's unclear sometimes what we're talking about. So one meaning of consciousness is essentially synonymous with awareness. A person who is unconscious is not conscious in the sense that they're not aware. They're unconscious. The other meaning of consciousness is the totality of our phenomenology, the totality of our experiential stream, and in which awareness and its objects are mingling, are, are involved. And in um, the Buddhist teachings of the five aggregates, the five elements, that all, um, all of our experiences can be deconstructed into, the fifth one being awareness, um, is like all the others, arising dependently. And one of the things that can happen is people can regard awareness 
as kind of a as an essence or a reified something that they can get attached to or identified with. And the Buddha was really clear, you know, awareness also is conditioned and that all conditioned phenomena are subject to passing away. They're subject to arising and passing away. If they've arisen conditionally, they will eventually pass away conditionally. So um, that's a detail, but an important one. Okay, awareness and consciousness. All right, I know I've covered a lot of ground, and I want to go back to the um, kind of statement that I shared with you from my friend Christian Prendergast, you are whole and complete. There is nothing to add. Okay, so any questions or comments? Um, so far, I'm seeing them in the chat. And if somebody has, would like to talk with me about this, if you have a question that relates to self-acceptance, letting go of the trance of unworthiness, and what it feels like to just uh, lay down the burden of constantly feeling like you have to add something to impress others or prove yourself, I'd be happy to talk with you. Just use the uh, reactions feature at the bottom of your Zoom window, put up your hand, and I'll call on you. Great. And I, I may, by the way, um, and I'll tend to preferentially pick people I don't tend to uh, you know, talk with before. It's not that I'm trying to be mean or anything. Okay. So um, I'm going to try to get to you, Lillian, but I may not be able to. So Tom, I'm asking you to unmute, and I'm going to make sure I have time for you, Anna. So Tom, my friend Tom Brown. Hey. Hey, Tom, what's the question? Yep. Hi, the question is, Rick, um, isn't, isn't this concept of being full, whole, and complete um, kind of as an automatic premise for my life or for everyone's life, isn't that somewhat of a cop-out perhaps, or doesn't it have the potential to be a cop-out for not developing one's full potential? I, I think uh, if I follow you right, there is the risk of that, right? And um, there is a kind of smugness that can sink in, you know, kind of like, hey, I'm just awesome already. You know, Rick said I'm all incomplete, right? You know, the Buddha said we all have bait, true, you know, true nature. So I'm just going to go smoke and drink and, you know, run through red lights and trample on other people because feeling groovy, right? You know, there is that risk. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> uh, I do like Suzuki Roshi's line. You, you've probably heard me say it. Um, you're, you're perfect as you are, and you could use a little improvement, right? That combination. But yeah, yeah, yeah. So I would just thank you for surfacing that. I think that's really helpful. I know for myself that, man, if, you know, if basically people can err on two sides. People can err on the side of sort of self-congratulatory complacency, you know, smug lethargy, <laughs> or they can err on the side of, I got to prove myself today. I got to make sure there's no fault that possibly could ever be found. Uh, you know, that's me. And, you know, for people like me and who are also the, you know, our culture in, in Western cultures in particular tend to produce that psychology in part because it serves the function of consumerist capitalism. You know, for people like me, and I'm probably not alone, um, this teaching from Christiana is really quite a corrective. You are whole and complete. There's nothing to add. Okay, great. All right, thanks, Tom. Okay, Anna? Yeah. Anna, I'm asking you to unmute. Thank you. Yeah. What's your question? My question is about condition and um, the role of nature. Ah. And in, um, in thinking of determinism and yeah. not, that there's no free will, that it's just unfolding yeah. intuitively that throughout my life I've not had free will. I've tried really, really hard at things and, yeah. and they haven't gone so well always. And I'm really, really um, curious and also hoping that you'll say there's no free will. <laughs> 
Ah, uh, okay. So, um, well, this is a really probably above, could well be above my pay grade kind of question, right? Because obviously this is one of the big ones. And um, I think what's helpful about it is to find what's useful pragmatically. I, for those who care about it, you know, sure, philosophical discussions of this, really interesting. Um, I'll, you know, tell you what I think the Buddha was teaching in early Buddhism, as best we know, and something that's been very helpful and real for me. So basically, um, there is this kind of contradiction that the Buddha, to my knowledge, and there may be Pali scholars who can really help us here, but to my knowledge, he never, he, he allowed for the contradiction in that, on the one hand, um, everything is subject, everything arises dependently. Everything arises based on preceding causes on the one hand. So in that sense, uh, if we mean by free will, we mean some kind of entity like a spirit or a, a psychological entity that somehow is floating freely. The Buddha re rejected that notion and strongly argued against it. And that's where the teachings having to do with the conventional notion of his time of the Atman, a kind of free-floating soul essence that was not um, caught up in causes and conditions. He argued against that, and he also argued against and continually undermined our tendency to imagine a self, a psychological entity that kind of floats freely in the mind stream. Right, and it's it's not that there isn't a sense of self. There is a sense of self. Just like right now, I'm aware of bumping, you know, my forearm against the microphone. You know, that's occurring. That experience, that sensation, or sense of self is occurring. But what is its nature? In the Buddha's view, argument, and my as well, is that the nature of all phenomena in 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 our unfolding of consciousness, awareness and its objects as a whole, great, uh, are dependently arising, they're, they're kin, great? So in that sense, it's just deterministically unfolding, all of it, including the sense of I, moment to moment, including our reactions to determinism. They are deterministically determined from whatever was the case the instant beforehand, continuously. You know, and the idea being that you could take the unfolding of the universe like a movie and rewind it and reverse back and there'd be a continual regression to first causes, the initial explosion of the Big Bang universe. That's, that's one view. Now, on the other hand, he said that we are responsible for our volitional choices. Well, how can we be responsible for our, our volitional choices? How can we inherit the karmas? of our volitional choices if we don't have volition, right? Right? I'm, I'm looking for some nods here, folks. I'm nodding. You're nodding, you're nodding. Okay, it's all good, it's all good. Thumbs up so far, right? And he lived with that. And he, and he basically, he, he said, live with it because, and, and I try to live with that as well. Now, some people try to do a kind of new age physics. Well, it's all about quantum phenomena and uncertainty. And I think, well, maybe, I mean, I'm, I'm willing to kind of allow for that sort of play, Lucy, Lucy-ness there. Maybe that's, maybe that's where volition starts to slip in and, and opportunity and, and all the rest of that. Um, where I think it really boils down though, and this is where uh, there are certain experiences and insights that pragmatically have a lot of value, I think. And I offer them to you. And then I'll, I'm going to move on to, um, let's see, I think one person, or there was to you, Lillian, and then we'll finish with that. Um, first, whether it's the result of deterministic phenomena reaching back, you know, 13.8 billion years, or not, it seems to matter to feel like you're making choices and to know that you have made a choice 
and to take responsibility for that choice and to appreciate the difference between, uh, as the Buddha said, wisdom is choosing a greater happiness over a lesser happiness. Or alternately, I think by extension, we could say that wisdom includes choosing a lesser harm over a greater harm. You know, eat less meat, uh, spew less carbon, um, dump less anger, you know, less, get less intoxicated in various ways, right? And we are the inheritors of those volitional choices. And he made an enormous distinction the Buddha did between the ritualistic um, orientation of the time that it would, that you know that kind of took volition out of the equation, and he basically said, no, it's not your uh, your the caste you're born into, it's not even the gender you're born into. It took a while, but ding ding ding, you know, his mom basically pounded some sense into his head, you know, over time, and he then was he ordained. Uh, women monastics, not just male monastics, um, but basically it's our it's our it's our volitional choices that really matter. That's what distinguishes us. It's like uh, it's um, our in our intentions make us holy, not just our empty actions, the gestures we might make, like some kind of ritualistic sacrifice. It's it's our volitional intentions. Well, why could that possibly matter if there wasn't some room for that in the mix? So on the one hand, and to really face up, fa fess up. I mean, all wisdom paths are gut checks. They're character at bottom in a lot of ways. And to just kind of grab that thistle. And in that context, to find gladness in your goodness, as he taught. You know, when you do choose the higher road, step by step, um, appreciate yourself for that because you've earned it. You've earned the appreciation and pragmatically it's skillful means because it's motivating to find gladness in your goodness. And if you look at the description of Kensho or Satori or the classic, you can, there's a lot of research now uh, about so-called non-dual experiences or the term of art often in the research is self-transcendent experiences in which the sense of self drops away and the sense of oneness with reality shines forth in radiant perfection. Um, one way into that potentially, and it, it, it has, in, for me it was a way in, was to realize that it really was all deterministically unfolding. Or I'll just say it, whether deterministically or not, it was simply all I am is the local unfolding of the larger universe, which has the opposite effect of despair. And suddenly lightheartedness and laughter start bubbling in with an awestruck gratitude at the giftedness of the universe, by the universe, from the universe, enabling and allowing this moment and this one and this one. Wow. 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 And to allow both those to be true, the importance of perhaps the illusion of the sense of volitional choice uh, and also Um, being okay, not out of disassociation or you know pathological depersonalization, but basically being okay in the knowing that all of you is a local unfolding of everything, which immediately becomes, for me at least, a huge smile and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thich Nhat Hanh is, writes beautifully about this, and he would say it much more eloquently than I can or do. Um, in this moment, I, I'm the unfolding of you. You are unfolding through me. I am unfolding through you. We are together. We are unfolding together, you know, influencing each other. We are, we are you know, currents in a single stream entwined together 
from beginning to end. That's the truth. And then to feel that truth, wow. So on that note, alas, Lillian, I apologize. I won't be able to get to you here. Thanks. And uh, we will have two guest teachers, Allison Briscoe-Smith uh, from UC Berkeley's Greater Good Science Center and also Stephen Snyder, uh, both deeply wise, wonderful guest teachers over the next two weeks. And I'll be back um, three weeks from today. So I'm going to keep unfolding. You're going to keep unfolding. We're going to keep unfolding together. I'll see you in three weeks. And thank you very much for your practice and your attention.